the first thing what I always do is check if the salt is closed because you really want to prevent that there is a blast radius of attack of salt, of course, on your on your meat and uh, or food. And yeah, that's also, of course, with uh, previous access management. You cannot prevent that your data gets stolen, but you at least can minimize the risk uh, and that is limited uh, data gets stolen because those so-called bad guys Maybe they're already in your environment, but at least if they steal certain credentials or whatever, they want to minimize that uh, attack. And therefore, again, it's really important that you have your maturity model also defined properly and your capabilities which you want to have. So it's also, you need to be clear what are your requirements in your organization. And I think also important is how do you sell this to your organization, of course. I can't think of anything worse than being assaulted. Oh, terrible pun. I know. <laughs> <laughs> this is Identity at the Center. If it has anything to do with IAM, this is the go to podcast. Now, your hosts, Jim McDonald and Jeff Stedman. Welcome to the Identity at the Center podcast. I'm Jeff, and that's Jim. Hey, Jim. Hey, Jeff. How are you? Not so bad yourself. Doing great, man. We're sitting here in the middle of the summer, and we had a meeting earlier today to talk about conferences and all the conferences that are coming up. And I'm like, how are we going to get any actual work done if we go to all these conferences? Well, that's the thing, right? I think um, I, I'm I'm always surprised at how good of a job you and I have done of separating our work life from this podcast. People don't know. We actually have real jobs. We are identity consultants during the day. <laughs> We're for a large company named RSM, and that's what we do, right? The podcast is like the separate thing. And yeah, there is work that needs to get done, plus the podcast, which is the separate thing, plus like conference attendance and stuff like that. So we are very busy boys basically throughout the year. Yeah, I mean, you know, we're very busy. And I think it's good that you pointed that out because I don't think many people either realize that maybe they think we do the podcast full time. That would be great, but that probably won't happen until like, because we retire from our day jobs. But <laughs> right. um, I, I think the podcast is getting to the point of almost being like a second, you know, job like moonlighting because most of the time we're recording sessions after the U S business day, mm -hmm. unless we are lucky enough to get a guest like we have today who is based in across the pond, in Europe or elsewhere in the world. And we have to kind of have some kind of realistic time that works for both parties. Yeah, exactly. And we're going to get to me in a second. I want to talk about those conferences though, so we can kind of take care of business before we get started with our main topic on privilege access. But you mentioned conferences. We got a bunch coming up. We've got identity week, um, identity week, America, September 11th and 12th. You and I are going to be there. We've got Asia, which is October 22nd, 23rd. Um, I'm not planning on being in there. I don't know if you are. Probably not either. Not, but unfortunately, either way, not this year. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to go. I've never been. So I'm always happy to go where any, pretty much anywhere at least once I'll travel to. Um, but we've got a discount code, IDAC30, IDAC30. That gets you 30% off of your registration for both um, the Washington, D.C. America conference as well as the Singapore conference in Asia. So you can use that code interchangeably for both of those or, or both and if, you, if you end up going to both. Uh, so that's the one conference that we'll be at. And then we just finally got our discount code, thanks to the, our friends over at FIDO. So shout out to Adrian. Uh, the Authenticate Conference, that's October 14th through 16th. That's in Carlsbad, California. Super cool location, as it was last year. Definitely recommended. Uh, any Anytime you can go to a conference that has like a good, you know, vibe and location, that's like, just like, puts it over the top. It's like a work vacation then. <laughs> it is kind of, but uh, it's a great spot. Um, kind of a resort golf course type things. So there's plenty of things to do. Uh, IDAC15, that gets you 15% off your registration for that one as well. I'll have all those codes and stuff in our show notes so people can check that out. And um, we'll have them on our website. I already put, put them on our homepage. So if you just go to IDACpodcast.com and scroll down just a little bit, depending on your monitor resolution, you should see all the codes there and stuff like that. So hopefully we'll see people there. Um, what else? We've got, you know, Gartner's coming up later this year. I think you and I are trying to figure out if we're going to make it out for that one. Identiverse has their regional events coming up in November. So there's one in Chicago, there's one in New York City. Um, looking at, you know, one or both of those as well to, to be at. But um, yeah, busy boys. So that's the conference stuff. <laughs> yeah. Well, and if you're out there listening, you're like, mention my conference. 
reach out to us. Yeah, tell us. Jim at IDAC Podcast or Jeff at IDAC Podcast or both. Like, give us a discount code so we can share it with our listeners. You know, everybody's looking to save some money these days and well, er, all days. <laughs> People <laughs> want to save some money. But um, yeah, we. We are the home for getting this information out there and helping people save money on attending conferences. Again, like from even from my own standpoint, I can't go to all the conferences I want to mm-hmm. with a day job. <laughs> yeah. Well, why don't we talk about privilege access management? And to that end, very excited that we have Mihil Stop. He's the director of identity management at Philips, joining us all the way from the Netherlands. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Jim and uh, Jeff, for the introduction. And I'm looking forward to be a guest in your Identity at the Center show podcast. <laughs> well, thanks for joining us. I want to take care of some downer business right up front. I know that you were cheering for the Netherlands against England in the Euro 24 uh, uh, match that took place recently. Um, I, I, You and I had a little bit of a bet going. Well, at least that kind of says, like, Jim usually starts us off with something negative. And so that was like our inside joke. And so I was like, all right, well, you know, just listen, see what happens. I don't think today was super negative. I think it was great. So kudos to Jim for keeping on a positive note. But I'm the one who's going to drop it down a little bit. Unfortunately, another one's lost in the last minute to England. How are you feeling? Yeah, it's it's a, it's a sad loss, of course. But as uh, Gary Lineker always said from the England, uh, the game is 90 minutes, and always the Germans will win at the end. But this time, it's uh, already two matches in a row. It's like uh, exactly for England, so they won the game in the 90, in the last 90 minutes. But they won the game. So, yeah. sad for the Netherlands, but luckily for the England. And in either case, identity and access management goes on. I mentioned when I introduced you that you're a director of identity management for Philips. Tell us a little bit about your journey into this field of I, digital identity or identity and access management or, or maybe both. <laughs> How did you yeah. get into the space? Is it something that you chose or did it choose you? <laughs> no. So uh, my journey at uh, identity and access management started after I graduated my master of uh, information management at the university. So just posted my resume on the internet and hopefully some recruiters would reach out to me. And then one of the companies which reached out to me was a consultancy firm in the identity and access management space. And yeah, I, uh, I really liked the conversation. So I joined it and from there onwards, I'm only in identity and access management, but looking back, I think I already had some background in identity and access management because I started as a system administrator, network administrator when I was a student. So they also needed to do account management and ensure that the people had the right access at the right time. And so now you're with Philips. Tell us a little bit. I, I feel like I know like maybe what part of what Philips does <laughs> kind of everywhere, but what is it that Philips does for people who aren't aware of that? Yeah, Philips is a company that has been founded more than 130 years ago. And since then, of course, we are improving people's lives with steady flow groundbreaking innovations. But as uh, technology comes and go, the same applies for company. So in the last decades, Philips transformed as a company in a health technology company. So we only health technology focused with a lot of brands licensed companies. So the light bulbs are not from Philips anymore. That's a different company and the same is for the kitchen appliance and the television. So nowadays we are really focusing only on the health technology. And at the center of the Philips health journey is then of course that we want to ensure that people are living healthy. So we want to prevent that you get diseases. So we have products there, but in case you need to go to the hospital, for example, then uh, we supply products for the health professionals. So they can also do some diagnosis, treat you, uh, help you with a treatment, not a treat, because that's something else. Uh, um, and of course, if you are recovering from, you need to recover, we also have products there. So we can monitor you from home. So I'm always curious about the sort of the day-to-day jobs that people have when it comes to identity. You know, Jim and I mentioned we do kind of consulting, not kind of, we do consulting during the day, right? We talk identity all day. Tell me a bit about your day-to-day. What's it like to be a director of, you know, identity management? Help people understand what that means. Yeah. So I need to ensure in Philips that we define our strategy, the vision, and the roadmap. So, uh, and also ensure that 
we get the buy-in from the management and get funding, of course, to get the things implemented to improve our security. And then I'm leading a, a team who is like of product owners, subject matter experts who are doing the actual implementation. So, Mihil, I'd like to transition to our topic for the day, privilege access management. I'm going to start real simple, like how do you define it, which simple question, but maybe a complex answer, because when you think about privilege, obviously, I think we all think domain administrators privilege, right? But if somebody can make a journal entry or they're a power user, is that privilege? I want to know how you define it or how Phillips defines, uh, maybe less about Phillips, but in your mind, how do you define privilege access management? Yeah, yeah. for me, privilege access management is an uh, umbrella terminology, which uh, consists of multiple, let's say, capabilities uh, to manage the elevated non-restrictive access of, uh, on the accounts in the application layers or platform or infrastructure layer. Yeah, and um, so... I'm kind of thinking one of the areas that I always kind of start my thinking when it comes to privilege access management is your policy framework. So having good policies around what is privilege. Yep. So what types of access do all these rules that we're going to lay out apply to? And then what are the rules? So, but then it goes beyond that, right? If you get the, the foundation of the policies, right. And you talked about this, right? So the way we, we got introduced was you were doing some presentation on privilege access management. You have a kind of a story. And one of the parts that you talk about is kind of the framework for how you look at kind of initial maturity up to um, more mature in terms of privilege access management. So given that, can you kind of talk about that framework a little bit? Yep. So... um it's really important, of course, that you also first understand the risk in your organization. So you need to have a risk register. So there you will define all the observations which you have in the organization. You will the observations you will link to the to the risk. Then you will define your mitigation actions, of course, and your roadmap items. And the second thing is indeed what is really important is your maturity. And you need to define a maturity model in your organization to understand where are you today and where do we want to be in the future. So what, what do you want to achieve? Now, what does that then look like? I think, do you want to zoom into that, Jim? So yeah, let's zoom in. Up. Let's get, get right into this. The identity at the center podcast, man. We're all about this. Perfect. So yeah, if you're looking at the maturity, you will, uh, I'm, uh, no, okay. But everybody knows when maybe what a maturity is, but we define our maturity metal from level one to level five. And that's based on the, um, is that Let's the from CMMI? the analyst companies? Yeah, from the yeah. analyst companies like Gartner, Copenhagen, or Forrester, they also provide a framework which you can use. And then vendors have as well a framework. Um, yeah, that's nice guidance. But within Philips, we defined our own maturity model um, uh, that's applicable across multiple domains, not only for the identity and access management domains, because my peers, for example, are responsible for trend management or data protection. So we have a standard model defined across these domains. Now, if you're looking into what does that look like, so you have capabilities, what I explained on the left side, then you have your functions defined and the functions are really like from level one, two, three, four, five. So think about session recording, full thing or whatever. Um, and these we link, capabilities we link to controls and controls you need to think about the standards, which uh, are existing around the globe is like the sys controls, the NIST controls, or the ISO. And these controls we have defined in, in our security management framework. And then we link these controls to uh, the threats. And that's defined in the Mitra track framework. So then you understand really the risk which you have in the organization. You link them to the controls and the capabilities. And then with the matrix, you can define, okay, where are we today? And that gives you a very clear overview uh, where you are in your organization and what you need to do in the next coming years. So first I want to acknowledge what you just said there around framework thinking. And I think this is something as a consultant, I learned very early on, but I think for our, the practitioner community, which I consider myself part of, um, you know, 
being able to talk in terms of industry frameworks makes you sound well prepared, not just sound well prepared, but be well prepared and tapping into, you know, some of these industry defined frameworks, like you mentioned, like NIST and ISO and ITIL and being able to say, okay, this is what the industry is doing, but then being able to make it make sense for your organization, I think is a very proper way to communicate, you know, what the expectations are to your organization. Because when, let's face it, when you're talking about privilege access management, you're not just, you're not defining the, um, the policies and rolling out the tools and then implementing the controls and then doing the work, right? These are, you're setting up tools for other people to use to securely manage access. And so um, being able to come up with a proper um, program and then communicate that in terms of a framework, I think is, is very key. Uh, but you also brought something else up. And so I want to shift the conversation to that, which is the importance of privilege access management relative to securing the organizational's IT assets, right? And so um, I think a big part of what privilege access management, so I think privilege access management, we think of as the lane of like controlling the accounts and controlling the entitlements, maybe check in and check out, but it's more than that, right? It also taps into areas like, well, manual controls. It taps into areas like governance, um, but it also taps into some areas like, okay, how do you shrink your scope, shrink your attack surface as much as possible so you have the least amount of area, surface area that you need to protect? And so my question to you is, like, what is your approach when it comes to minimizing that attack surface or that blast radius as they're sometimes called. Yep. So I use always an example. I also explained it one time to Jeff. It's about the example of assault. So um, I was with, uh, attending a conference and was sitting on a table and had a conversation. And of course, if you have you get your food served on the table, maybe you want to have it more, a little bit more salty or whatever you saw, then you take the salt. So, and then you want to put the salt, of course, on your uh, meat, potatoes or whatever. Um, but the first thing what I always do is check if the salt is closed because you really want to prevent that there is a blast radius of attack of salt, of course, on your, uh, on your meat and the, or food. And yeah, that's also, of course, with uh, privilege access management. You cannot prevent that your data gets stolen, but you at least can minimize the risk and that is limited uh, data gets stolen because those so-called bad guys, maybe they're already in your environment, but at least if they steal certain credentials or whatever, they want to minimize that uh, attack. And therefore, again, it's really important that you have your maturity model also defined properly and your capabilities which you want to have. So it's also, you need to be clear what are your requirements in your organization. And I think also important is how do you sell this to your organization, of course. I can't think of anything worse than being assaulted. Oh, terrible pun. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking of the analogy, and Mihaly and I were talking about this the other day, of kind of like a submarine, right? If there is like a, you have these little doors throughout, and they can, if one part gets flooded, close the door and sort of prevent the rest of the, of the boat going down. Your example is way more positive than mine. <laughs> so we'll stick with yours. <laughs> You mentioned there briefly about getting support for privilege access management. And now that we kind of understand, right, we have a definition of what it is and why it's important. This is the next step in my mind is how do you get support to actually do something about it? It's like, okay, at some point we have to like stop talking and start doing something to better secure, lower risk, maybe make, maybe make people's lives easier, I'm not sure. Uh, but how do you work through that process of selling the PAM program or the PAM project or initiative, whatever you want to call it, to your organization to say, okay, yes, we've got buy-in. Now here's the funding or the resources to go get it. Yeah, yeah, I think that's the hardest thing, of course, because it's not really visible uh, for everyone. Because and it's, 
it's only limited. So it's really that only to the IT department from a lot of people, I think, but it's not only limited to your own IT, maybe it's also to manufacturing, your OT or your R&D. But yeah, that's the hardest point, of course, in uh, previous actions, man. How do you, how do you sell it? Uh, because it is not really fancy or whatever. It's like, maybe you need to see it like your electricity or water. It's working. So why should I invest something which is working? Because those services are running fine. So why should I do it? And I think from my perspective, from my own platform or application or infrastructure perspective, I have the feeling that I'm really well controlled because here there has been an audit done. And according to this audit, it is, uh, it's fine. So you never should treat this individually per application. So you need to look at the bigger picture. And I think it's important if you look at the bigger picture that you sit together with your compliance and audit department and that you have clearly defined, okay, what do we want to measure? What do we what what do we want to have res as a result of looking into these audit reports? Because there are there are a lot of findings in it, and then also explain that to your management, make that visible. So, just as an example, it's like just look into how many of the software you're using are using the default accounts, uh, which are provided by, by the vendor. So the audit reports will give you this data, or how do you deal with access review, even as privileged uh, access. Do you review these access rights? Who has access to it? When it's revoked for the last time or are the elevated access revoked or whatever? So you need to look at all these kinds of things and get that data that will help you. And then it's going back to your risk register again because that helps you with your observations which you have to provide the evidence. And if you have this, then yeah, you can show to your management what the risks are in your organization and why they should invest in it. Do you find that your message changes context based on who you're talking to. I would assume you'd have to, you know, talk one language maybe to more technical crowd versus less technical language to a different crowd. How do you manage that context switching to make sure that your message is being communicated effectively to whoever your target is? And maybe there's examples like if you're talking to, you know, maybe a let's call it, you know, CIO or a CEO versus maybe a manager in another area, or maybe even someone from the business. How do you how do you approach those conversations to get that buy-in and get that support? Yeah, that's a very good question, uh, Jeff. So, <laughs> so um, yeah, first of all, first to get the buy-in from your own management, because uh, try to sell the story to your own management, which you have, because I think if you convince them, then it's all, they will also guide you how you can convince other people, and then they can sell it as well. For example, your CISO or CISO or the Avenue organization can also sell it to, to the CIO where it's needed, or they can help you to tell your story to the CEO and uh, get the challenge. Of course, that's different than if you're talking to a service manager because a service manager is always looking from their perspective. So they always will get the questions like, what's in it for me? So why sh why should I do that? Um, I'm fine. So yeah, maybe my colleague is not fine, but I'm fine. So yeah, there you need to use a different approach, of course, always, and explain what the benefits are. So Mihil, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about running a privilege access management program within your organization. And I wanted to start at the very top in terms of... Um, you know, kind of the approach to governing the program. And my question is, you know, do you see privilege access management as being its own program or part of the identity program? And I'm talking about in terms of philosophically speaking, but also in terms of actually like, do you have separate steering committees for the two? Because I do see them as to a, a large extent being a different audience. What are your thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. First of all, it's always related to, of course, to your company strategy. So you have company strategy and you have your security strategy, and then you have your IM uh, strategy. But indeed, what just you mentioned, you have for, let's say, uh, identity and access management, your umbrella terminal. So you have separate domains, and one is then the privilege access management. So you have different stakeholders there. So you need to do stakeholder management. So you need to identify who are you stakeholders are and then also per stakeholder you need to define it's like okay should you keep uh, them informed should i manage them closely or etc so that's what you will need to do with your stakeholder management yeah now okay so let's take it down a level so when you get you're talking about kind of is organization dependent maybe that's the answer for all these 
Um, but I'd also like to get kind of like a hot take on some of this. So in terms of like operations, you know, building out um, privilege access management capabilities, running them on a day-to-day -day basis. So let's take an example of password vault. So you're deploying a password vault. Who does that deployment? Is that the identity team? Is that the system engineers who are going to use the identity vault? And then in terms of yep. operations, who owns and runs that thing after it's deployed? You know, you get that, that three o'clock, somebody three o'clock in the morning, somebody's working on a server and the password vault is down. Do they call the identity team or do they call the vendor and fix it within their, their group? I, or how does that work, it, work best? I think there are three models and it depends on your uh, company. So um, you have maybe a central model, uh, federated model I call, or decentralized. If your organization is using a central model, then you are defining the strategy, you are doing the implementation, you define the policies, you have everything in control centrally. Um, you can also use a federated model and in a federated model, there you def define your policies, the processes, you do the actual deployment. But the responsibility is then in the business because the business needs to make sure that they comply to your policies and everything. So they need to support you with doing the actual implementation. And the decentrally, then everybody is, has their own responsibility. And we are using a federated model in the organization. So we drive everything centrally, but the business is in the, in the end, of course, responsible and accountable for that. Do you have a, a rule of thumb in terms of like, if you go to the central model or the decentral model, how many people you need on your digital identity team to support those models? If you're looking into the number of FTE, yeah, uh, in, in Philips, we have it a uh, lot of outsourced, say like that. So we have like one SME product owner uh, who is responsible for that. And then we outsource everything to a managed service part provider or an implementation partner. Um, yeah, it depends on how big you are as a company and what you want to achieve, of course, with you during your deployment. So if you want to, and how many servers you have in your organization and what that's, so there's a lot of dependencies. So the, the size of, of that varies. And then you have, of course, an operation team who manage the platform. Uh, we also outsource that, uh, in the company. So it could be in-house outsourced or whatever. So we have, a, a it outsourced in our organization. So if you're looking into the number of people who are currently involved in that entire privilege access management area, then I think we have around 15 people. Okay. okay. Well, that's pretty, pretty I, I think those rules of thumb are just um, helpful for the listeners in terms of when they think of standing up a program like this. I think the other interesting aspect is like everybody's coming into this at a different point. Um, I think a lot of what we talked about, probably it's easy to picture from like an on-prem, we run the data center kind of model. And that's how privilege access management was designed from the beginning. And then you had this thing called cloud spin up, right? And it's, I don't know if it's going to be around. I don't know if it's going to make it, but this cloud concept, it seems to have created a lot of privilege access management use cases, scenarios that put things on its head. And not only that, I think developers tended to be the ones to kind of lead the charge or developers, not the security department, led the charge to stand up clouds. And then the security department had to come along and, and figure out how to secure it. And so I'm wondering, do you kind of share that perspective and have you any techniques to share with our listeners in terms of how to take an environment that's spun up that maybe doesn't have all the controls that you would want, or maybe a, you know, a nuanced set of products that differs from kind of the approach that you had to date. Yep. A lot of this. So, uh, just using the example from us, uh, so we started with the program in 2018. Now it's already 2024. So uh, 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 back then we had like physical data centers, for example. So we want to implement a password fault to manage the credentials of uh, in the physical data center on the uh, platform layers. 
But in the meantime, the world was, of course, changing because the cloud came there, which you also mentioned. So you need to adopt your strategy after a while and change it. So it's not just like, hey, I define like this. No, maybe because the world is constantly changing, you also need to look again at your risk. So yes, you set uh, your North Star or weather uh, or whatever on the horizon, but it's never a straight line. So it will always go like this. So you need to adapt to that as well. So it's like, okay, maybe there's some other risks are now more important than that we uh, thought of. So yeah, then adapt your strategy. Uh, I can excel that story to your management, why you need to make these changes, why, why there is a higher risk, and why we should invest there. Because now, so also you see with, uh, uh, there's like, Capability for cloud infrastructure and entitlement management. Now, we were not aware of that, of course, a couple of years ago, but it's something which is now important because if those hackers get access to the, or the bad guys get access to these environments, yeah, then they get access to a lot of information, of course, or maybe they can shut down your business even if they get the wrong credentials. So, you, yeah, so you need to adapt your strategy. Uh, and it's a challenge because there, what you also mentioned at the introduction, there are so many credentials. So think about SSH keys, you have your API credentials, you have like uh, your domain admin accounts. There are so many. So where you will start? So yeah, you need to f- define really where the risks are and uh, accept that also that there are other risks and you cannot do everything in one go. So I feel like this is... To... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I, say, I, f- I feel like this is an area where, you know, Policy and process only take you so far. And it's one of the areas where it's like, you really need technology to have this be effectively controlled and managed and so forth. Um, you know, would you agree with that statement that this is really something that you do need technology, whereas maybe something like an identity governance, you could always sort of brute force the provisioning or deprovisioning of things. But if you really want to effectively manage SSH keys, um, you know, certificates, uh, you know, APIs, you need to have some technology there to effectively do that. Yeah, I fully agree with you. So it's nice to have your soft controls defined in your framework, uh, but yeah, soft controls, never a hard control, so you cannot enforce it really. So you really need to have technology in place uh, to enforce these controls. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about that technology because I think this is an area where there's a lot of good choices that are out there. Um, you know, it's it's kind of like the, the 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 pro and the con, right? Great news is there's a solution out there that will probably fit your needs, and there's lots of solutions that you can be successful with. The trick is always finding the right solution that's the right fit for your use cases, you know, your company, those sorts of things. How what's a you know what's a methodology or a framework that people can use to think about to say, okay, how do I go about this? Do I try to find you know one privileged access management project that kind of does it all? You mentioned cloud infrastructure timeline. Right? That's kind of a growing space that has its own dedicated tool set. And sometimes it's a dedicated tool and sometimes it's part of another tool. Walk me through how you select, you know, the right product or right mix of products <laughs> to better secure your organization. Yeah. So, yeah. And also the market is a lot changing, of course, uh, Jeff. Mm-hmm. So there you see a lot of vendors are now... Uh, investing in other companies and sp- and buying uh so and there's a lot of merging of companies to say like that so the other the the privilege access management is really changing in the market there as well so um i think it's important that you go back to your maturity model where you define your capabilities and your functionalities because that also gives you already good understanding on the requirements which you have uh, sometimes you need to detail out a little bit more the requirements because the maturity in that level is off uh, to a high level so you need to define your use cases, and and then use these use cases requirements which you defined, um, go for example to Gartner and also to the Copinger Call or Forrester, and then do a mapping on your requirements, what the product vendors offer to define your shortlist, for example, and to get an understanding, but also have conversations with the analysts. Um, to like, okay, do we did we properly define our requirements? What do we overlook? Or what do you see changing in the market? So uh, that I think that's really important to do, to also listen to your peers. So in other companies, what they are doing, learn from them uh, to ensure that you make the right product selection for your company. Or multiple I mean, definitely- products, maybe. <laughs> I, need to say, so. <laughs> I mean, this is definitely an area where you can talk with other people, right? You're, you're probably not the first person to do it. <laughs> so, you know, why not get that knowledge? You know, maybe it's yeah, at a conference or maybe, maybe it's a local network or, or things like that, for sure. 
Yeah, God, should again. Oh, go away, Jim. <laughs> no, I'd like to throw in there. I think the, that's the two-sided coin, right? I think we should tap into our uh, peer network to learn, but you also have to be willing to be on the other side and tap into your peer network and educate. You've got to be willing to share. Like That's one of the things that Jeff and I really wanted to do with the podcast was make this a community of sharing information. So you can't only take, you've got to give as well. That's the only point that I wanted to make. Yeah, I fully agree. And that's the reason I loved your introduction about the upcoming conferences, because there, that's where you need to share your knowledge and experience and learn from each other. Because what Jeff also mentioned, you're not alone. So other people have faced these challenges as well. So please reach out to your peer, share also your knowledge, because we can also learn from it. So uh, for every, a lot of people, things are new. So the best ways to team up with each other. And in the end, we all have the same goal to improve the security of your organization. Yeah, for most of us, security is not secret sauce to the success of the organization. That's other things. I get it, right? There's security vendors and things like that. Of course it is. But for the most part, we're kind of all in it together as a community from a digital identity perspective. Um, let's. I, I want to kind of close out the conversation by you putting on your future-looking baseball hat to say, what is a upcoming feature of or capability or something in this privileged access management space that you get really interested in? Like, ooh, that could be something that could really kind of change the game. Is there anything like that that you've seen? Yeah, I hope that the signal framework will help because the big challenge currently uh, in the privileged access management areas, there's still, we are uh, everybody's saying we need to have zero trust and zero standing privileges but you're still depending on technology eh, from application platform infrastructure layer, but also what the vendors offer. So now you need to find the right balance between uh, these privileges and zero standing pri privileges. And I think the signal framework can also help you uh, with that. So I'm putting my hope there that it will solve a lot of uh, privilege access management challenges. Yeah, and I'm, that is totally unprompted. Uh, that reminds me of the uh, panel that I did at Identiverse with my friends uh, Tool and and Sean uh, talking about that shared signals framework and being able to adapt and use right the same kind of parlance to be able to have security events going through there for whatever it may be, right? Whether it's continuous authentication or evaluation or whatever it may be, or even just having a, a, a pipeline that we can all agree, like, here's the language we're speaking. <laughs> And exactly. have those data signals, you know, work through and take advantage of the data that we're already collecting. Jim, you got thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, I think that the signal framework is a great proactive, um, preventative control. I'm also just thinking on the de detective side that you need to be monitoring your environment. You need to look for the unusual activity at the identity layer to say, okay, well, this person is in our environment and switching identities, and that's an abnormal behavior, and then taking a proactive step to maybe disable those accounts. You know, in other words, stop the threat in its tracks, and today we call it ITDR. I don't know what we'll call it five years from now when maybe it's just um, everybody's doing it, but I think, I think that's probably, in my mind, potentially the most important thing about privilege access management is being able to detect when the wrong actor is using PAM. Um, I think recording it, I think, you know, sharing or storing credentials, I think the signal framework, all those things have huge benefit. But I think that they're you know, you, you, I'm not going to call them point solutions, but they solve a problem at a certain point. Whereas monitoring should be an umbrella that looks at everything. It's not completely true either. It has to integrate points, but that could be the fallback. And you have to do, you have to do monitoring anyway. So that's my, my input. I think that's a good spot where we can probably close up the conversation. Um, I do want to end on a lighter note, as usual. Uh, Mihail, I've never been to the Netherlands. What is something that I should do my first time there? Like any activities, food, locations? Like what should I do as a first-timer? And then I'm going to compare that against Jim, because I think you've been to the Netherlands before. 
and see if we're on the same page. Okay. Yeah. I'm from the south of the Netherlands, so I would recommend to go, for example, to a city that's called Sechtogenbos. It's a medieval city, which is really, really nice. And then eat, a, you would, we said about food, eat a bossa ball. So that's like a whipped cream inside with chocolate on top of it. It's really like a bomb, but if you eat it, it's really nice. So that's I really recommend to go to, uh, to eat and also visit the city because it is a beautiful city. Yeah. Okay, you had me at uh, whipped cream and chocolate, <laughs> for sure. Uh, Jim, what is uh, something that you'd recommend that I would do, having been there? So I'd been there, and I was there for work. So fortunately, I got to go and have all my bills paid for. Um, on the weekend, I wound up staying in a town by the North Sea. So it was a beach area. I mean, it was fantastic. And I will say that there was a vendor outside of the beach and they were selling i think it was sandwiches with like raw fish or maybe fish that was like pickled i didn't try that all right so that's not my food recommendation but <laughs> north sea i definitely recommend i was staying in a city called leiden um during the week and my food recommendation is not really a surprise anymore so i had never heard of stroop waffles prior to going to holland and Basically, they're like a cookie with uh, like a waffle looking cookie and there's caramel in between and you put it on top of your coffee and it would heat it up. And oh, it was like a gooey, wonderful thing. Now McDonald's started mixing them in with with their McFlurries. So now everybody there's no surprise for everybody. But wow. Fantastic and you get them on treat. United Airlines too. Like that used to be like one of the things they do in the morning. I don't. Oh. Are Stroop waffles a thing, or is that something that we've taken to America and like turned it into like something that isn't really a thing? <laughs> I don't know, yeah. Mahil. Is that like is are Stroop waffles something yeah. there? It's from typical from the Netherlands, indeed. Yeah. So uh, yeah. Jim is right, and I think it's indeed one of the nice things in the Netherlands which you need to try. Uh, but yeah, you already had it from the United States, and you said in the during your flights. So, uh, yeah. I can't imagine the United Airlines version of a stroop waffle is like <laughs> the creme de la creme, the tip top. <laughs> like if I'm going to have a stroop waffle, like what, where should I go for a stroop waffle? Yeah, buy them fresh on the market. So if you're visiting a market or whatever, there's always you can buy a stroop waffle and then they are really nice. Okay. All right. Sold. I think I need to make a fact finding mission to go get some stroop waffles. Um, thanks for setting me up for that one, Jim, because I, I I'm a big fan of stroop waffles. I'd never heard of it until, you know, a few years back when when United started giving them out. I'm like, ooh, what is this delicious <laughs> treat? <laughs> Very good. And then I got hooked on them. Um, okay, let's go ahead and wrap it up uh, for this week. Uh, Mihail, thank you so much for being part of this conversation. We'll have a link in our show notes to your LinkedIn if you're comfortable with sharing that so that yes. people can reach out with questions or concerns or stroop waffle uh, locations that people should be checking out. Uh, you know, we'll have the links for Jim and I, as well as LinkedIn. We always love to hear from folks who have ideas for shows or questions or comments or concerns, or heck, if you want to hire us to do identity consulting, that too. Uh, we're on the web, idacpodcast.com. We're on X, Twitter, whatever it's called by the time this gets to your ears or face, uh, at IDAC Podcasts. Uh, I did set up our DNS entry, so now we have idacpodcast.tv. We'll take you right to our YouTube channel. <clears throat> we are trying to grow this, so... Please don't hesitate to like, subscribe, do all that fun, you know, YouTube stuff to help us grow this channel and get the community built out even further. And let's see what else. Mastodon at IDC podcast at infosec.exchange. And yeah, I think that's it. So with that, we'll go ahead and leave it for this week. Thanks everyone for watching and or listening. And we'll talk with you all in the next one. You've been listening to Identity at the Center. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review. And we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit the website at identityatthecenter.com. See you next time on Identity at the Center.